So I'd like to welcome everyone for joining us today for this webinar on low threshold buprenorphine. My name is Javier Cepeda. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I will uh, be moderating discussions uh, that we have planned today. Um, but before kicking things off, I'd like to especially thank the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy and specifically the Office of Public Health, including Jenna Bluestein and Beth Connolly for helping put this event together. Um, now I actually would like to turn it over to Beth Connolly, Director of the Office of Public Health at the Office of National Drug Control Policy for a few opening remarks. Thank you, Javier, and thank you all for joining us today. Um, we're really excited to uh, help with this webinar on low threshold buprenorphine opportunities and challenges. As Javier said, I'm Beth Connolly and I oversee the Office of Public Health. And I bring warm welcome from Dr. Gupta, the director of the Office of National Drug Control Policy. He had hoped to be here today, but he was called away at the last minute. Um, today's webinar examines an important topic on how we address opioid use disorder and the overdose epidemic connecting people to treatment. Medications like buprenorphine are the gold standard for opioid use disorder and reduce risk for overdose by more than 50%. Given the current overdose crisis, it is especially critical to increase access to these medications. And from a societal perspective, medications for opioid use disorder or MOUD is cost-effective compared to non-MOUD interventions and has also been shown to be effective in reducing recidivism. We've come a long way in getting buprenorphine prescribing into office-based care, but there's more that we need to do. We need to reach people who are at the risk of uh, overdose, such as individuals who are not engaged in the traditional treatment setting or who are not ready to stop all drug use by meeting them where they are and offering lower barrier options for buprenorphine treatment. Settings for low barrier programs can include hospital clinics, telemedicine initiation, and syringe services programs that can offer buprenorphine to patients without delay as soon as they are interested in treatment. And as low threshold programs are often delivered in non-clinical settings, they're important in helping reducing stigma and improving retention. The National Drug Control Strategy lays out the actions that the Biden-Harris administration is taking at the federal level to ensure a whole of government approach to treatment that supports low threshold, flexible, and patient-centered care. During today's webinar, you will hear the evidence from the field, a discussion on policy and practice, and at the end, we will take your questions. Again, welcome, and thank you for taking part in this very important webinar. I'm very much looking forward to spending the next two hours with all of you. Thank you, Beth, for mentioning these very important points. Um, I also want to provide just a very brief overview of the webinar. Um, so let me just, so just to, uh, as, as Beth actually had mentioned, um, we have two sections to the first hour will be devoted to uh, research um, with uh, presenters talking about evidence from the field, um, and we'll have some time for a Q&A, and then a very small break, and then before moving into the policy and practice uh, panel discussion with uh, Dr. Ingrid Olson uh, from the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA, and also uh, Barbara Bazaron, DC Behavioral uh, Department of Behavioral Health, um, and also providers and people working on the front lines of delivering low threshold buprenorphine, including Angela Wood and Joseph Muller in Washington, DC. And then we'll end with another uh, Q&A and some concluding remarks. Um, because of the format of this webinar, um, there is no chat, as you may have uh, observed. Um, however, uh, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, please raise your hand and we will be able to unmute you so you can uh, speak up and, and ask uh, one of the presenters. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, go to our first, um, our first speaker, uh, Dr. Caleb Bantagreen from the University of Washington, uh, and also director of the Center for Community Engaged Drug Education, Epidemiology and Research uh, at the Addictions Drug Alcohol Institute. Um, so take it away, Dr. Bantagreen. Can I share my, stop sharing my screen? Great, wonderful. Uh, thank you all for uh, inviting me and I'm really excited everybody's joining us. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and as someone who's worked in Surrey for 27 years, I'm putting all my eggs in this basket. Uh, this is kind of the best we got right now and I think it's pretty good and I'm excited to share it with you. So I'm gonna talk about on some of the work we've been doing here in Seattle and Washington State over the last um, six or seven years um, and share with you some lessons learned from all of that work. 
So I don't have any conflicts of interest to report. Um, you can see my funding sources here. And I'm gonna start off with sort of why community-based low barrier care. I also would refer you to uh, Dr. Weinergrad's great paper on that topic. So take a look at that. Um, we launched uh, Seattle's buprenorphine pathways back in 2017. I'll describe that as really the catalyst for uh, what has since been a, a research project I've been working on uh, to implement a uh, six site study across Washington state for low barrier care. And then I wanna talk a bit about implica implications and next steps. So catalyst for a new way. I just can't say this enough. People do want to reduce chaos and often their use, and they do want effective care. There's good research on this, and we have some research on this as well. We've done a statewide syringe exchange survey every other year since 2015, and we asked folks, do you want to stop or reduce your use? We don't ask people if they want treatment. That's a very different question. Uh, we ask them if they want to stop or reduce their use, and 80% say yes. We ask them, what services would you want if they're easy to get? Number one answer, treatment medications, buprenorphine and methadone predominantly. So, most want to stop or reduce their use. Most want the, best, most, the most effective treatments. Um, and then we have some challenges is that, you know, emergency department access to buprenorphine is wonderful. We absolutely need that. But that's trying to manage a chronic condition in an acute care setting. And that's a setup to not have long-term success, except when what we have found, if you create easy to access drop-in care in the community, emergency departments may be more likely to initiate care because they know there's somewhere for people to follow up. And the same thing with jails as well. Really importantly, also good research on this, people use drugs often do not feel welcome in traditional healthcare or substance use disorder treatment settings. And in our work specifically, um, among people who needed healthcare in the last year, 60% said they did not get care because of how they are treated by providers. So what do we do about that? I think we, we take the demand and we think about where to put it. Uh, and so we really see treatment, harm reduction, recovery overlapping. That's, I just, I can't say that enough. They need and they can and they do overlap. It's very important that we don't think about these things in a binary context, but in a human context, what people's goals and needs are, uh, what treatment can be, uh, what harm reduction is, which is not just supplies, it's person in place. Yes, supplies, but person in place is essential. And thinking about recovery, many, if not most, people continue to use during recovery. So they're going to need treatment and harm reduction at the same time. And so we really have to stop thinking about these silos and think about how to bring this work together. So from my perspective, sort of a medication first model for OUD, the essential elements are drop-in visits, uh, short time the medication starts, ideally on the same day. Other substance use is allowed initially and ongoing. No counseling or support group mandates, but always offered. And urine drug screen testing is to understand buprenorphine utilization and other ongoing substance use. So this particular model around buprenorphine pathways the catalyst for this was I'd had an R01 to do a behavioral intervention uh, around overdose prevention in the emergency department and offered naloxone. We had a slight but non-significant decline in overdose as a result of that, a null result. And we had just heard back at the same time in 2015 that 80% of people wanted to stop or reduce their use, and they were already at syringe exchanges. So I worked with Public Health Seattle King County to, to help launch this model, which they did a beautiful job of. They choose, chose to use a nurse care manager model, similar to the, the Boston, Massachusetts model. Um, at a large public health clinic where there's a large syringe exchange. So the nurse would see folks, they'd get the prescription ordered, and there was an on-site pharmacy. And I'll show you some data from that briefly. This is really exciting to me. This is the demand curve for care. So on the left side here, this is an interesting metric on the y-axis. This is the number of conversations. Um, and what it shows is in blue, conversations that were initiated by clients or participants, and in red were conversations initiated by staff. So you can see in the first few weeks, most conversations were initiated by staff, but by week five, the majority of conversations were initiated by clients. Word had spread that quickly. We were at capacity within 12 weeks and people were lining up two hours early to get treatment. They were lining up two hours early to get treatment. So I don't believe people don't want treatment. <laughs> they want the right type of care in the right place. And we do have a paper on this, a paper on this uh, study. We have really high client demand or super high needs population. Um, less than a quarter were stably housed. Most used multiple substances initially and ongoing. Buprenorphine was almost always documented in urine drug screens, increasing from a third to 96% of urine drug screens, with a significant decline in illicit opioid use from 90% to 41%. No, it didn't go to zero, but it dropped significantly. A couple of quick things here. Uh, retention, which I won't go into in too much here, but on the left side here, we have two-thirds of people had a single episode of care, and their retention looks very similar to a stable population in primary care, about 50% at six months. 
about a third of people at intermittent care. What's exciting about that is it means they kept coming back. And I can't say enough about how important that is. They kept coming back. Uh, we had one death in the first 180 days, so about a 1.4% estimated annual mortality rate uh, compared to about an expected mortality rate of 6%. I just wanted to make sure we weren't inducing harm, and it does not appear that we were. We also had challenges referring people out to other care settings, which we thought was the goal. Was that we're going to move people into primary care? Most people didn't want to leave the clinicians they already had good trusting relationships with, and most providers didn't want to take them. Many folks, even though they were taking their buprenorphine every day and were very consistent coming in the clinic, they kept using methamphetamine. And a lot of primary care providers simply would not accept them into care. Um, this is a quick side note, but I encourage people to take a look at this paper. We looked at all the PMP data in Washington State, did some really comprehensive analyses, looking at sort of those two different models, right? A single episode of care analysis and a cumulative time on care analysis, which from a public health perspective is what matters because every day a person is on medications, the chance of overdose plummets. So we really wanna look at a cumulative care model. What we also found in there is you don't know when it's gonna stick. So we found long episodes of care in the first, second, third, or fourth episode. So it's really important to keep that door open. This was really striking to me. This was very early on, very early on in buprenorphine pathways. A nurse reported this from a client and the client said, I relapsed last week. Every other time I've relapsed while in a program, I kept using because I knew I'd get kicked out. But I knew you wouldn't kick me out, so I didn't keep using. It's a little bit complicated. <laughs> That's the abstinence violation effect. And essentially we broke it uh, because people knew they could keep coming back and stay engaged in care. And that is really, really important. So we took this model, which we were really excited about, it was very promising. And we adapted it to add care navigators to the nurse care manager model. And also we created sort of a six month duration of a medication start and protracted stabilization. We still sort of hoped we'd be able to move people into primary care and we still struggled with that, but we created some added value I'm excited to show you. So you have six sites across Washington state, three in Eastern and three in Western Washington. These were uh, five uh, syringe services programs. One was a program for unhoused folks, all really importantly embodied harm reduction in their interactions and in their spaces. And really importantly also, I can't say enough about this, this is not a plug and play model. Regular implementation support from our clinician researcher team was essential. Um, and I also learned this in our SOAR work. We continue to have monthly calls with all the different staff involved in this. It's just essential to advance practice, to have connections, to feel supported in your work. And this is challenging work, uh, particularly during COVID. So we use a quasi experimental study design. We have really rich state data. So we have a synthetic comparison group that we'll be um, matching with. And our outcomes are gonna include a care, acute care utilization, non-fatal overdose, deaths and arrests. Our primary funding, our catalyst funding was the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation here in Seattle. And we're very fortunate then to get additional funding from our state healthcare authority, from Primera for our rural sites and for Seattle Foundation. We had IRB approval from uh, the state and UW. And we did have a protocol paper published earlier this year if you're interested in that. We enrolled 833 people between July of 19 and 11 of 21. I will say 1,300 people receive care. And this is an interesting approach, um, very different than an RCT. We uh, created this care setting. We offered people care after they knew they were getting a buprenorphine prescription. Then we asked them if they would like to enroll in research. We wanted to maximize the validity and generalizability of our findings. That was really, really important to us. Our very early preliminary data, and I've got outcomes data like in the email chain right now, but our very early preliminary data, which was incomplete, showed way over 60% of people had buprenorphine dispensed on the first day. Well over 80%, well over 60%. I think we're going to be closer to 80%. And I can't say enough about that, as opposed to a primary care setting, where you might have to go to two or three appointments over a month before you're able to get your life-saving medication. And then also in terms of face validity, uh, the staff who've done this work forever, when we started implementing rolling this out and seeing client uptake, they were like, this is what we've been waiting for. So we're getting final outcomes data right now and we hope to have our outcomes data uh, published early next year. I do wanna share some uh, preliminary data around the care navigation component of our work. Um, we have over 1300 folks with almost 13,000 care navigation encounters. I'll show you those data in a moment. Our key findings were that care navigation fits flexibly and productively within community-based harm reduction programs. Participants want and use these services, especially in-person support. Providing OUD treatment with a harm reduction orientation supports honest conversations about drug use. That's actually probably number one. When I did my training 27 years ago in a methadone clinic, um, 
there was no incentive for people to be honest about their substance use. And it in fact set up an antagonistic relationship. But in fact, if people can be honest about their substance use, you can have a collaborative relationship, you can talk about treatment, you can talk about recovery, and you can talk about harm reduction. You can't do that if people don't have a place where they can be honest. I think these care navigation services can be a really important feature of a broader, low barrier, one-stop model of healthcare, more broadly available at harm reduction programs uh, for people who use drugs. And this would also include hopefully wound care, mental health care, and other aspects of care. So a little bit of data, almost 13,000 client interactions. 41% um, of these activities were in person during COVID. This is really important. And this also, um, that we include in this count, texting and emailing and phone calls, but substantial amount of care was in person and it's really important. Telehealth is awesome. It really is not for this group of folks. Um, it just isn't what happens. And that's fine, but it's important to know that. So I mean, in terms of what people wanted to talk about, there was number one was retention, current drug use, polysubstance use, ongoing recurrent opioid use, appointments, but also housing, physical health, craving, family, mental health, all of the other aspects of people's lives. And then what I like this quote from one of our care navigators who said, my mission is to make sure people know that they can come in anytime for any reason, no matter what they did or didn't do, it can take a while for people to trust that we really do care about them. So next steps, we're doing continuing uh, work around financial sustainability. This nurse care manager, care navigator, and harm reduction services are typically not reimbursable, only often at provider visit, the prescriber code is, and the prescriber is essential that they represent a tiny piece of the amount of care that's being delivered. Workforce is a major limitation, particularly a nursing workforce. I really think uh, an expansion of both methadone access and long-acting buprenorphines can be very important, uh, particularly given what we're seeing with fentanyl nowadays. And I can't say enough about the need to co-design and evaluate services with people with lived living experience of substance use disorder. Uh, we as researchers and experts need to be very humble and listen um, so that we can actually uh, be of service to folks in the community. So given these persistent treatment harm reduction recovery gaps and dramatically increasing needs as manifested by our highest overdose mortality rates ever and the promises of low barrier care and the desire for such care for people uh, by people with substances, how do we support transformative models of care on a national scale? You know, especially addiction treatment, primary care, great. I think those will be a minority of care. I think this model of care needs to be the majority of care. Here's some resources. And I'm happy to make this available to folks later uh, around additional information on low barrier care. And that's what I have. And I'm excited to see what I hear next. Thank you so much, Dr. Bentegreen. Really excellent presentation. Um, like I said, we'll hold questions until the end, um, but please uh, don't forget to uh, to raise your hand once the session, uh, once the presentations have concluded. Um, so next, uh, Dr. Uh, Justine Wellman will be presenting um, from the from the Reach Project. I think it's interesting because we have similar. Data. Um, we also, although it's not mentioned in our um, in the presentation, we do quite a bit of research for a community-based organization. Um, but I'll start with. Let me just get this to go. So, um, Reach Medical is located in Ithaca, New York. It's a, a nonprofit, tax-exempt medical practice under the Reach Project, which is the um, nonprofit entity. Um, it was, I founded this after working at a syringe service program, um, which was one of the first medical health hubs in Ithaca, New York, and became completely sort of enamored with this work and um, with doing stuff for these folks and realizing that a bunch of people I knew were also interested in doing this. So our mission is to be the national leader in harm reduction medicine by increasing health equity, reducing overdose rates, and expanding access to high quality care. Um, from the beginning, it was clear um, to me and to others that what we're really looking at is a health equity issue, um, not, not far off from what we saw with what we see or saw with HIV and AIDS. These, this is people doing things that other people don't think are appropriate. And that judgment keeps us from giving good medical care. 
um, deliver respectful, equitable access and compassionate health care through a non-stigmatizing, low-threshold, evidence-based approach that emphasizes harm reduction. We serve individuals who experience substance use disorder, housing or food insecurity, and other social determinants of health that result in poor health outcomes. So we were formed in 2017, and we opened to the public in 2018 and became a state um, outpatient treatment center in 2020. Um, so the model of care is that we have a low threshold anti-stigma harm reduction framework. We have a team-based approach. It's become much more team-based as we became much more based in telemed. And so we actually have a, as I'm the provider, I was this morning, I have a guardian who's the person who gets the person on the phone and then a nurse who organizes um, care, but sometimes because we think we're the best team, I'll get people on the phone while someone else is getting so that we can get a lot of people on. Um, and then we also have like a daily signing provider and on call coverage with nurses and providers. Um, we have integrated care, um, integrated care mostly with hepatitis C, HIV care, PrEP and PEP. Um, we also have behavioral health and I'll go into that um, in a little bit. Why is that not going? Oh, okay. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So we order medications. Um, we do medications for opiate use disorder, primary and acute care, which we had to kind of do just locally in one or a few counties, because as we started going out, it became pretty impossible to manage. We do quite a bit of hep C testing and treatment. We do quite a bit of outreach, which actually started with COVID. Um, we started sending um, folks out with a tablet who go out into our homeless encampments and to places where people are, like the syringe service program, to the homeless shelter and other hotels where people are often staying. We do PrEP and PEP. We do integrated behavioral health, which means, um, would you like to talk to a social worker today? Not anything that's mandatory at all. Um, we are an OOP training site, which is a New York State designation, meaning that we give out um, naloxone. Um, of course, we also prescribe it, but if someone comes indoors we, um, into the office, we give it. We do HIV care, case management, and we also are the case manager for the law enforcement um, assisted diversion program locally, um, which ends up being quite a few of our patients. And uh, when national when we came on national thought they were going to have to teach us about harm reduction so i think it's been a good match for them um as described earlier the big barriers to care are stigma transportation housing insurance um systemic it's not even just stigma there's a lot of discrimination um and some thoughtful things come up like is it okay to go to the hospital for wound care and someone checks your bags, but not any else, anyone else's bags. Um, and the hospital is saying, well, we're worried they're going to overdose, but is that a form of discrimination? Um, your partner can't come in, is that a form of discrimination? And so things like this, I think happen in lots of settings. And um, I don't know that anyone really um, I think we just need to do more. Um, child care is a big issue for folks and um, food and financial security, clothing, all of these things, um, toiletries are a huge issue. So um, basically what you see with all these barriers is higher health care and community costs, um, barriers that prevent um, individuals from seeking timely treatment. That especially happens um, in all communities with wound care. Um, right now with xylazine and what's going on with ice, a form of stimulant in our community, there's a lot of new infections coming up and people don't want to go to the hospital. There's an increased distrust of the medical system and likely lack of timely treatment leads to poor health outcomes. So um, low threshold care, um, I think it was Aaron Fox and his group who did this paper. It's an approach that provides consistent medication access treatment across, it should be, wait, I'm sorry, an approach that provides consistent medication access treatment should be easy for patients to start and continue. So low threshold buprenorphine treatment should be guided by the following principles, same day entry, harm reduction approach, flexibility, um, wide availability and convenient location. Um, 
what I say is, so I started the work through service program, um, really loved it, um, and thought it was great because you can, you don't really have to be that like stuffy doctor. You can just be like, what's up? How are you feeling? And, um, and people like that a lot more. And um, so I started, and basically, I think a lot of folks don't know what, what happens at a syringe service program, but it's basically what everyone wants to have. Like it's a place that you go, uh, there's always someone there to help you find housing benefits. And a lot of people of course have trouble with all of these things. They often have showers, laundry, and basic hygiene items and food. They have computers and phones for personal use. And then of course they are all, they also give um, sterile syringes and other safe supplies for use. But all of these things are important. Two and three have been a lot more difficult since COVID came up where I don't think places have as much of an opportunity to bring people indoors. But, um, it, it is exactly um, as Dr. Banta Green brought up. This is the concierge service right here. These are the these are the folks that if you if the folks at the syringe service program know that you're good, then it, it really is um, just a word of mouth. So I was going to the syringe service. I'm also an emergency medicine physician. I was going to the syringe service program once a week, and by week three, this was at the point when a prescriber could only give 30 scripts out, we were filled. And then we were having um, what seemed like inappropriate conversations about who deserved the next script, um, which is a sort of interesting thing to have to do. And that's when I just thought, wow, there'd be a lot of people who would be interested in doing this kind of work. And when we opened REACH, I wanna say, Within a year, we had 1,200 patients out of 20 counties, um, and it was all word of mouth, no advertising. So um, basically, when you add medical services, you have this culturally competent staff. They trust the staff. The folks trust the staff there. They begin conversations, and just as um, the doctor said before me, basically what happens is they start begin. they start asking and then they start coming and showing you like it's it, you know you think they're coming to be like i've got to get off this methamphetamines but like i have a cut on my finger um i'd like you to look at it right now and so you look at the cut on their finger or whatever it is and then they just are really great nice people to work with um and also what happens is you give medication assisted treatment um probably better known as medications for opiate use disorder so what happens for us is, um, and I think these numbers are a little bit off, but in general, um, meaning that I think our network, it's hard to measure the network of patients. I believe that actually within a year, this 70 to 150 goes to 350, um, it can go super high. But um, whenever we get, whenever we collaborate with an SSP, we have an average six month retention rate of 89%. Um, about 12 visits per year per person. And each time we just talk to someone at a syringe service program, they give us a patient that leads to 70 to 150 patients. Um, because if you're good, that's how you get patients. Um, what we've learned, and um, this is sort of a reiteration, is focus on, you really need to focus on getting the patient's trust and learning from the patients. So I think there's always this feeling like what a patient does is bad. Why not be interested instead in what a patient does, which is like, well, how do you, ex why would, what do you get when you inject meth? And it's funny, most people will say it calms them down until they can't sleep or they don't like it or they like this or they like that. And it's a really great way to get to know people and what works for them. Um, we very much focus on drug screens, diversion, and abstinent, um, mostly because there isn't, to me, great research on doing drug screens in a population that's already coming to you saying they have opiate use disorder. Um, and diversion, all of the studies so far have pointed towards it going to good use. Um, SSPs offer access to people who use drugs in rural settings, and we're in a rural setting via word of mouth. And I kind of believe that 
it's kind yeah. of like the um, six degrees of separation. They know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody, and that's how you get to know folks. Um, this is our collaboration with certain service programs. So in 2018 was when, um, um, well, 2017 was when I started working at STAP, um, Southern Tier AIDS Program. And um, then by February of 2018, we open. Then in 2019, we start going to Johnson City, the other, their, one of their other syringe service locations. Um, and then in 2020, COVID happens, but um, a, a syringe service program in Plattsburgh called us, and we have a ton of Plattsburgh patients now just by them calling us on the phone. In 2021, we were asked by the Department of Health to help out on a street corner in Utica where people were actually overdosing and dying, hanging out on the street corner. So we sent um, a, a community health worker up with a tablet and they would call back to us and we enrolled folks. We're involved with New York Matters, which is a referral program since 2021. And then in June of 2022, which has been our most recent collaboration, um, another syringe service program that has a health hub, their provider um, had some trouble with their license. And so we took over 96 of their patients and um, basically that's where we are. In 2019, um, we rapidly converted to telehealth. Um, we've published a couple of studies on telehealth and there really is a population that can't, um, can't get to care, they can not They can often get a phone, although it may not be a great phone, but they can get on the phone. They may not be able to do video and a lot of that has to do with age and educational level. And um, so a lot of times I'm talking on the phone to older folks who would never go anywhere because they're humiliated by the whole situation. Um, and then this gives, a, gives you an idea of what happened. So, this is um, basically one year of service. This is basically pre-COVID. Um, so in pre-COVID, we were in um, 149 zip codes in 26 counties, having opened in just February of 2018. So in two years, we had folks from 26 counties. And all we offered was being nice and giving buprenorphine pretty much no matter what. That's it. Um, and then in April, once we did telemed, you can see this is the North Country or Plattsburgh. Then we went up to 197 zip codes and 34 counties. And then this gives you an idea of the ability to hit rural um, zip codes. So we were in 68 rural zip codes pre-COVID and then 106 rural zip codes um, during the first year of COVID. Um, this is where we are all together. We have 4,200 patients. We have a six month retention rate of 72%, 90% white, 8.6 black. Um, we have a 56% male and 44% female population. The median age is 37 and um, we have about a 66% Medicaid population. In August, we went to same day inductions and um, that was pretty spectacular. 197 same day inductions um, done in, in a two month period with 281 new MAT patients overall. Um, and we have a really great um, dispatch system, I would say, where we, we have someone who gets on the phone and um, talks to the patient right away, then gets them to the provider, and then we are able to get them their buprenorphine. Um, a couple of things about that is when we're talking about challenges, um, where I think I've tapped in every mission-based provider in New York State to either contract with us or work for us at about a quarter of what a provider earns. Um, which is the same for myself and the other, um, our director of research is, is an internist. Um, and so we're really up against the idea that being a nonprofit that gets about 27% income, oops, I'm sorry, 27% 27% income from, um, from billing and 83% from um, 
from grants and it's hard to meet the wages at this point. Also hard to meet the wages of NPs. Um, I think we're doing well otherwise. Um, I just wanted to show you just one more thing um, and that'll be, I don't know how to get out of this, hold on. That should be fast, um, really fast if I can get myself together. Um, so we conduct research and we have um, a Pew Community Opiate Response Evaluation. And this happened between June of 2020 and August of 2022 with our partners from Wild Cornell Med, um, basically looking at our MOUD, MOUD patient intake, patient experiences, um, a satisfaction survey and patient qualitative um, interviews. And what was interesting is, oops, yep. Um, the survey was, I'm just gonna skip over some of it, but the survey was made available, oh, it's time, to 3,000 patients and 180 responded. And I just wanna give you one cool thing. Um, patients said that, um, 86% of patients said, did you speak with any other staff member? And they said, yes. Then asked, was the staff helpful? They, got, they gave us a 99 percentile. And did we treat you with um, courtesy and respect 100%? Um, and we have some great um, quotes from there. And I don't think any doctor's office gets that. So we feel pretty proud of that. I'm good. I'll stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Wallman. So such a positive note to, to leave on. Um, and then finally, uh, just our, our third speaker uh, is Dr. Rachel Winograd, Associate Professor in the, with the Missouri Institute of Mental Health and the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about Missouri's medication first approach to OUD treatment and briefly going over our findings from the last five years. Um, I do want to sort of take us back in time a bit and give it a different context and setting for those of you who are coming from states without a network of SSPs because you do not have legalized syringe access or you have not had Medicaid expansion or the vast majority of your federal dollars for SUD go to the traditional block grant, you know, substance use disorder treatment programs. I'm talking to you because that's where we're coming from in Missouri. So first, I do wanna also back up and talk about another large uh, public health concern that we face in this country, and that's chronic homelessness. So our traditional approach has been a housing readiness model where you go from taking people who are living on the street to a shelter with tons of rules and group housing, and then maybe eventually independent living if they can make it to that, you know, addressing other issues prior to demonstrate their quote unquote readiness. That does not work. And in comes the housing first approach, which says, you know, what if we addressed homelessness with housing? What if we provided this life-saving resource to people rapidly and permanently, and then went from there? So coming back to opiate use disorder. So in Missouri, I'm talking about, you know, late 2016, early 2017, we were in a position like basically every other state in this country where we viewed OUD with a, a real need for detox or an over-reliance on residential treatment and group therapy and education. Uh, we addressed SUD broadly through an acute care lens rather than a chronic care lens. And we did use buprenorphine and methadone within our safety net SUD treatment program, but often as a last resort or at low doses or for a short amount of time or only you know, to taper someone off to get them on a naltrexone product. So we knew this was not working and we said, we have all these best practices, but how do we package them? How do we frame them rather than just giving a people a, a monumental list of like things to do or not do? And we said, what if we borrowed from housing first? And we said, you know, just like housing is this life-saving resource for people who are unhoused, can't we say the same thing for medication about medications for people with opiate use disorder? And we looked at the key principles of housing first and they were surprisingly adaptable to medication for OUD. And so, you know, we, we rolled out this medication first approach with four key principles. And again, this was largely directed at our traditional safety net state contracted substance use disorder treatment programs that were you know, brought up in a traditional abstinence only model. And we were trying to convert them to this lower threshold approach. 
So the first principle is hard to argue with, it's chronological. It's that people with OUD should receive medical treatment as quickly as possible prior to lengthy assessments or treatment planning sessions. And this just sort of openly admits if someone is puking in your waste basket in your office while you're doing a three hour intake, that is not helpful for anyone. Uh, we didn't get much argument by trying to change that. The second principle is that maintenance pharmacotherapy should be delivered without arbitrary tapering or time limits. We would hear you know, from physicians, well-respected physicians, oh, I do buprenorphine, but only for three weeks. Or my limit is six months, and then you're on your own. And it was not individualized. It was not based in any sort of evidence. It was quite arbitrary. The third one is that individualized psychosocial services should absolutely be offered, but not required as a condition of continued medication. And the fourth is that we should not discontinue medical treatment unless that is what is clearly worsening the patient's condition. So this becomes most relevant when people continue to use other substances like methamphetamine or benzodiazepines. So instead of disciplining or discharging people for repeated use, you know, we would hear things about like a three strikes and you're out rule. Um, we say, you know what, do not discharge people unless it's the, the medication itself that's causing you know, unfortunate side effects or the person themselves wants to get off of it. So flash forward to the first 12 months of implementation, we compared people who were enrolled in the state targeted response grant. So this was the large bucket of funding that came from SAMHSA from the heavens in 2017. And that's where we rolled out medication first. And we compared people who were in those treatment programs to people who were at those same treatment programs the year prior. And we found that indeed through STR, people were more likely to get meds, more likely to get them sooner. They received fewer psychosocial services because they were then optional, and they were more likely to be engaged in treatment long term. And then in turn, it cost the state 21% less per month on average. And this was entirely a function of the longer retention. You know, the longer you're in treatment, the less intense the needs are, so the less it costs. So if we want to look over time then at the last five years, combining the STR, SOR, Med First approach and programs with sort of our treatment as usual. If we just wanna broadly look at the uninsured population in Missouri, where they uh, you know, present for treatment and those treatment episodes that they're engaged in, what we saw over time in, in terms of medication utilization is indeed that first year, uh, well, prior to STR, nearly 60% of treatment episodes involved no medication whatsoever. And then the next year, that first year of medication first, that proportion greatly reduced, even broadly, not just in STR, SOR. I can show those graphs separately uh, during the Q&A if there's interest. But then when we look over time, we see that the size of these yellow bars, brownish, tannish, that re refer to episodes with zero medication has sort of stayed around 35 to 40% and hasn't nudged much. When we look at retention, again, longer retention is something we want. Uh, when we're looking at a chronic care model, we see that year prior to STR, people stayed in treatment for a median of around 71 days. Then you look over time, you see this, this, this purple bar here, that first year of STR, definitely the highest. We saw this big jump in retention. But when you look at the combined treatment, again, the broad uninsured population, we did still see an increase from the year prior to med first, but again, it sort of stayed steady. Uh, you know, uh, around 50 days longer. Now we did some listening sessions with treatment providers across the state in those early days because you know, this was our target audience, our, our, our traditional SUD treatment programs. How did this go? What was working well? What wasn't working? And we got some themes of, of some, some concerns or pushback or feedback, however you wanna frame it. The biggest one was that we were saying medication first, but people were hearing medication only. And we just kept coming back to people saying, but what about the root causes of addiction? You're just throwing another pill. And this is where we really had to clarify our messaging that we were talking about. We were not saying counseling is bad. We were saying that required counseling is not helpful and often only serves as a barrier to treatment, but other things should absolutely be offered. So we're still working on that messaging. Another thing we heard from frontline providers is that it was very difficult for them to adjust to this sort of newer, sicker client base. You know, they were saying, we, when you lower that threshold for care, a lot more people hop over it and stay in our treatment with that intermittent treatment, as Dr. Bontegreen was saying, 
So we are having a bunch more no-shows. We have people who are overdosing in our lobby. We have people puking in the parking lot. You know, my, my frontline social workers or counselors were not trained for this. They were trained for people who were coming back to treatment because, you know, they had gotten their life together. They had met a threshold of functioning uh, that we were essentially demanding of them and we were able to work with that. But now with this client base, like we're not sure what to do. And what about those other people who now we maybe need to turn down because we don't have the capacity for them, but maybe they quote unquote want it more. And then lastly, the fiscal aspect. Nobody wants to talk about this, or, or I mean, some people do, but really like this is not financially viable in our traditional treatment system. When we're talking about reimbursement rates, these are models that were built on an abstinence-based model that relied on group education and group counseling and those intensive services, you know, eight services a day to make their revenue, to keep their lights on, to pay their staff. And if the state is now saying, you got to lower that threshold, let people come in and out, you know, you don't have as many people showing up to groups, like you can't keep your lights on, you can't pay your staff. Uh, so this just simply has not been financially viable over the long term for our safety net SUD treatment system. And this is, you know, not their fault that they're like, look, what do you want me to do? This is an unfunded mandate, essentially, and something has to change. And I'd be remiss not to talk about the racial disparities within all of this. So Missouri is one of many states in this country where we have seen widening inequities in our overdose death rate, especially among black men. We have resource deserts in predominantly poor black parts of Missouri, especially in St. Louis, which is where I reside and is the epicenter of our state's overdose crisis. We were seeing that you know, even when people did access substance use treatment or OUD treatment, there were real disparities in retention such that programs were retaining their white clients but not retaining their black clients, even though there were sort of similar rates of receipt of medication. So what was going on there? And then if people were engaging, black people have been less likely to get some of these wraparound services, housing supports, telehealth, peer support. So it's not just about getting people in the door, it's how do you keep them coming back and how are you making this treatment that, that fits what they're looking for and what they're able to do. So to summarize our findings, our widespread push for MedFirst has been effective. You know, we have increased use of MOUD broadly, especially buprenorphine. And overall, we've significantly improved long-term retention, which is really important. But overall, our progress has plateaued. And are these retention benefits that are so key to improvements in functioning have not been equally felt by everyone. So looking ahead, we have to find a way, and many in Missouri are working very hard on this, uh, to make low threshold MOUD financially viable for SUD treatments. You know, unless and until we are adapting, adopting some of these low threshold models in SSPs or federally qualified health centers, you know, we have to figure out a way to make it work with our traditional SUD treatment system and a way for them to keep their lights on while delivering low threshold MAT. We also need to talk about client survival and meeting basic needs. I admit that I was sort of myopic at first, um, looking focused on the medication first aspect and not realizing the limitations of that, that if we are not addressing transportation, income, physical health, and most importantly, housing, you know, how much progress are we really making? And I talked earlier about the housing first approach and that makes sense for people who are unhoused. Medication first makes sense for people with chronic OUD. But what about people who have OUD and are unhoused? And too often we feel like we have to, we people on the front lines working with the people on outreach are first forced to choice, choose in a given day, do I go with housing first or do I go with medication first? And we do not have programs in Missouri at scale that can do both. And that's really what we need. And then of course, addressing the racial disparities aspect of this, we need culturally responsive and relationship-based healing approaches. We need to value these and push on them just like we've talked about medication and naloxone access, which have been hugely important for saving lives. But if we wanna do this long-term and, and use an equity lens like we're all talking about, we have to invest in treatment by and for black people in Missouri. So I'd like to thank our addiction science team at UMSL, especially our evaluation team, Zach, Brittany, and Paul, 
and Ned Presnell, who uh, co-developed the medication first approach with me. Of course, our Missouri Department of Mental Health and SAMHSA are uh, the predominant funder. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Winograd. Um, I know we just have a few minutes um, and I see a couple hands up. So I'm gonna go and let uh, Leslie speak first. Um, you can unmute now, I think. Leslie, do you wanna, you wanna unmute? Okay, um, Dawn, feel free to chime in. Can she, uh, thank you. Can she uh, repeat about the required counseling not being helpful? What what aspects of required counseling? I, it just kind of, it went over my head. I, I guess, I, you know, maybe I had an ADHD moment. <laughs> Sure, I'll, I'll speak to that, Don. So let me clarify. Principle three of our medication first approach was that counseling should not be required as a condition for getting medication. You know, uh, I, for example, used to work at a methadone program where it was there was a sticker on the dosing window that said no group, no dose. Uh, and that is exactly the type of thing that, you know, serves as like insurmountable barriers to people. Um, so we use counseling sort of dangling it as a, as a way to get medication, which is a carrot. And so medication first, this approach sort of said, just like housing first, how you don't have to engage in these other services and evil it in order to keep your house. This house is yours. This apartment is yours. Same thing with medication. You don't have to come to my counseling services in order to keep getting your medication. If you want to, awesome. I have this full menu of fabulous things to offer you. But if you don't, I'm not going to make you. And so that, um, that's been the, the toughest one, honestly, for us to roll out and adopt because people sort of have a really core uh, objection to it. And of course, the fiscal piece is challenging as well. Okay, thank you. And Javier, you're muted. Sorry, I'm muted here. <laughs> um, so I think uh, Stephanie might have been also had a question. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, for this incredibly valuable um, uh, topic. And um, I, I run a um, an ombudsman office here in New York State, um, and it was great to hear Dr. Waldman uh, talk about. Um, Reach. I know I've referred a number of folks uh, to Reach, um, but I was I was interested in sort of the um, the challenge that um, uh, one of the and I apologize for not um, remembering the name of the first presenter um, out in Seattle, um, but I heard a comment um, during his presentation that um, telehealth was not for. Um, uh, the population that um, we're speaking about today. And I, I sort of think about what, um, you know, what, I, what, what I've been able to do, um, you know, in after hours um, or even during hours on weekends, evenings, et cetera, et cetera, and getting folks who could not come in tr into in-person um, uh, appointments, but were able to get help uh, using telehealth and get on medication quickly. I just wonder if, um, you know, the presenters could speak about that, um, especially now uh, during, you know, uh, COVID and post-COVID, uh, where we're really trying as, as um, you know, uh, as, as folks that are in government to try to figure out what are best practices uh, for this population. Yeah. Um... I mean, I said that strongly, and I think it's part of in reaction to a lot of what we saw during COVID was the miracle of telehealth. And telehealth was great for the people it worked for. Folks who were in rural areas had a primary transportation barrier. But for folks who are in more urban areas or even small urban areas, small towns who are often unhoused and are nearby, in that context, really am not seeing telehealth as a major component. So very important the context and the settings and the rurality and the types of issues folks are placing. I mean, I I'm excited to learn more uh, about Dr. Waldman's work as well, because there certainly is a place for it. 
I just don't want us to put all our eggs in that basket, uh, particularly for folks who are quite marginalized and often in towns and, and do have physical access. Um, so it just, I think it's a, I should say it's a both and. I think it's something we definitely need. I just want us to not walk away from in-person care. If I could chime in there, I think there's a new study actually showing how great telemedicine is. Um, but I agree that there's, um, what we're finding is potentially in encampments and places where folks are hanging and they're unhoused, um, their phone that they have today may not be the phone that they have tomorrow and uh, um, the phone gets stolen uh, much more than would happen. So like basically if you're doing outreach because people are um, not housed, I think that with a tablet actually works really well. Having a community health worker go out and talk to folks and see um, mostly because of um, I think a tablet works well there because you want someone sort of acting at the top of their license. So if I'm waiting to talk to one person, but I could telemed with four others, um, that helps a bit. But um, yeah, we do we do a community based um, outreach approach with a tablet works quite well. Okay, I think um, Mika. Would you like to oh, hi. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Oh, okay, thanks. Um, my question was actually for um, Dr. Bonta, the first speaker. Um, because, so I'm a medical student and I don't treat anyone. So I'm just um, asking this from what I've seen in treatment. Um, I noticed that a lot of providers recommend a 12-step program um, to substance um, use disorder, or opioid use disorder patients, and that they often face the same problem when they get there that um, even, <clears throat> even though there's, it's like this keep coming back attitude, there is a strong uh, antagonistic attitude towards uh, medication management or medication assisted treatment um, and that it's not a very welcome welcoming place and additionally that um, sort of the harm reduction approach isn't isn't accepted in a lot of in a lot of treatment communities and a lot of um, the workers that seem to be in in recovery themselves and um, I just wanted to know if you might be able to to speak to that and um, sort of if there's another peer group out there that they might be able to find support in or um, if you see it, the current treatment changing or if um, it, it has to just be built separately. Um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll try to unpack that and I'm interested to see what my colleagues have to say. So specifically around 12-step models of care, I think those are beneficial for some folks and there's some places that it can be helpful for them. But when it doesn't work for them, that is not the person's failing. It is that that is the wrong uh, supportive care for them. And that's really important because they are told that they are failing as a person and that is incorrect. So that's a challenge. I think you're speaking also to a more broader issue that um, Dr. Weiner had mentioned as well. I was trained in this model, you know, our 50 year old 12 step Minnesota model, Hazelden model of care, which they now support Suboxone. So that should tell you something, um, is very important and it's predicated upon abstinence. And that is a real, um, it's an old fashioned notion. It's an alcohol notion. Doesn't happen to work just for alcohol either. That area is ch changing as well. Um, there's just a lot built up into this. We have a specialty addiction treatment system that has a very specific model of care that SAMHSA continues to primarily push. That's important to understand. And they incorrectly state that counseling is necessary for treatment medications to be effective. That is incorrect. That is incorrect with some of our federal agencies are saying the research doesn't support that. Counseling, I mean, Rachel's a psychologist. I'm a social worker. I love talking to people. And a lot of people benefit from that. But the added value of on med above and beyond medications is modest and not statistically significant. 
That doesn't mean it is not significant and invaluable for some people. It is, but it can't be mandated. The evidence doesn't support it. And the same thing for 12 step. It can be valuable. It can't be mandated. The evidence doesn't support it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, just out of the interest of time, we'll just take a quick four minute break. We'll come back at five after. I know I see a lot of hands up. I'm so sorry. Um, but if the speakers will be around also for the second, maybe we can also be an opportunity to ask some of those questions in the second uh, uh, portion of the webinar. So um, apologies. Or if, uh, you know, if Dr. Winograd, Bonta Green, and, and Walden, Dr. Wellman, if you, if you guys need to hop off, maybe um, they can email you and, you know, and answer questions like that too. So thank you. Um, so we'll just be back in just a few minutes. Thanks. Okay, I think for the interest of time, I think we'll get started again. I just received a quick note from Dr. Waldman and she said if if anyone would like to email her, unfortunately she did have to hop off um, to feel free to email her. Um, don't have a chat, but her email is jwaldman at reachmed.org. Um, so feel free to reach out to her. And again, apologies for those that, that had the hands up, um, but hopefully we'll have an opportunity to, to answer your questions. Um, so with that, 
I think we are ready to begin the second part on our policy and practice discussion. Um, I think it was really great presentations in our first half and really great discussion as well. Um, we'll have also some time for Q&A and some concluding remarks. Um, so I'd actually be like to begin with introducing Dr. Ingvild Olsen, who's the uh, director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment at SAMHSA. Um, and I'm not sure if you have slides, but I think you should be able to, to share them. Yeah. Great, I do. Thank you so much. And um, I will do my best here to quickly get these up. Can everyone see those? Great. Yes. Thanks, thanks so much. And thanks so much for including me um, on this uh, webinar and this really um, fabulous panel. Um, so I am going to um, just talk a little bit about some of the work that SAMHSA is doing with respect to low threshold buprenorphine. And, um, you know, uh, just to um, note that <clears throat> SAMHSA absolutely is um, uh, supportive of low threshold buprenorphine, th low threshold approaches um, essentially to substance use disorder care. Um, as you can see on this slide, that of the five priorities um, uh, that SAMHSA um, currently uh, has, Preventing overdose and integrating primary and behavioral health care really fit, um, and these models fit very well with both of those priorities. Um, you know, we know that over 40 million people reported having a substance use disorder in 2020. Um, and if you look at some of the cross-cutting principles here between equity and workforce, financing and recovery, um, all of the what we've been talking about and what we've already heard from um, some of the folks on the ground. Um, these models really uh, um, uh, fall in line with many of those um, those principles. Um, and you know, I think you've also heard that um, we unfortunately are at a point in time where we just have an incredible record overdose death rates, um, primarily driven by fentanyl and illicitly manufactured fentanyl and other opioids. And so making sure that we are reducing whatever barriers we can to getting people into um, effective care um, and uh, with the um, medications like methadone, like buprenorphine, that we have significant, uh, significant evidence for um, being able to reduce mortality. Um, that is something that is um, a, a, a high priority for, um, for SAMHSA. Um, and we know that there is a significant unmet need for treatment um, uh, and that much of the treatment um, uh, treatment world out there, um, you know, still uh, we have some work to do in terms of really being able to, um, to get, uh, get people the services that we know are evidence-based. And so I'm not going to go through too much of the principles of low threshold treatment. You've already kind of heard about those, but um, these are some of the uh, policies and, and the um, pieces that SAMHSA um, is absolutely uh, um, a proponent of. So same day treatment entry, meaning that we're really initiating medication <clears throat> at that initial visit. It's medication first, not medication only um, for, for many individuals and really taking harm reduction approaches so that we're um, making sure that we're meeting people with uh, dignity and respect and pro promoting that throughout the um, the work that uh, and the programs that SAMHSA um, uh, and CSAT in particular funds, making sure that we understand that this is a chronic disease. So um, not everyone is going to um, also uh, achieve uh, um, stability, remission, recovery at the same rate. Um, and but making sure that we are providing those services, providing the care um, that uh, that really does meet people where they are and um, it can help promote. Um, uh, the health and well-being of individuals. So that means being flexible in terms of offering and giving people options for the different psychosocial services that they may find beneficial. Um, but as uh, the former speakers talked about, not requiring um, and not tying and making contingent um, the medication uh, on um, the use of those services, um, particularly at a time when um, uh, it may be the services may be um, uh, provided at a schedule that is on the provider schedule and not necessarily on the individual um, participant schedule. Um, and as you've heard, being able to provide um, treatment in a mobile uh, 
um, or non-traditional units or, and settings. So I just wanted to highlight that, you know, some of you may have heard about the HHS buprenorphine practice guideline back in, um, that was uh, uh, released back in the end of April of 2021, that really for, um, uh, removed the eight hour uh, training requirement for physicians to be able to prescribe um, buprenorphine for the treatment of an opiate use disorder. As you can see here today, that's that 30E um, category here, that close to 20,000 practitioners um, have availed themselves of that opportunity, um, many of which have been physicians. And as we looked at some of this data, many of those physicians actually are practicing in um, emergency department settings. Um, so that is one of those non-traditional settings that, uh, that really people can get started on their medication um, uh, as one, um, one important way of really initiating care. Um, and now we have over 130,000 um, uh, pract practitioners across the country that then can continue um, and uh, um, those medications as well as initiate um, uh, medications like buprenorphine, um, specifically buprenorphine in their practices. So I just wanted to um, highlight uh, a, a few of the notice of funding opportunities that um, came out in FY22 um, that where SAMHSA did include low threshold buprenorphine as an allowable activity. So you heard mention um, from Dr. Uh, Winograd, I believe, around the state opioid response grants. So that is one of the largest grant programs that, um, that SAMHSA funds uh, and that has specifically included low threshold buprenorphine models as um, one of the, the ways in which states um, and their subrecipients can really um, provide access to buprenorphine for individuals um, uh, who um, may elect that, uh, that medication and um, really benefit from that. But there are also a number of other grant programs that you see here. So um, the Services Grant Program for Residential Treatment for Postpartum um, Women, uh, our MAI um, program, uh, the FR CARA, and I'll talk a little bit about that, um, Matt Padoa, we specifically also in FY22 um, with the funding from the American Rescue Plan provided harm reduction grant programs, um, the first dedicated harm reduction grant program um, from the federal government that also allows for low threshold buprenorphine access. So I'm gonna um, just give you a couple of different um, kind of uh, stories, real life stories of where our grantees have incorporated um, low barrier buprenorphine um, uh, program. So this is a uh, through the um, medication assisted treatment um, PDO program um, in Oregon, um, in Salem uh, County, the um, uh, helping to provide services to the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde um, Indians. This was one of the first uh, um, opioid treatment programs that served uh, Native Americans, uh, American um, Indians through the Great Circle Recovery um, Program. It is a tribally owned and operated within the state of Oregon and has actually now implemented same day access to life-saving buprenorphine to over 400 Native and non-Native individuals. Um, and as you can see, it offers a harm reduction model of treatment really by offering that pathway for, for individuals that are not yet not yet ready to fully engage in behavioral health services. Um, they are also operating the, the state's first mobile medication unit um, that is also uh, enabling people to access buprenorphine um, outside uh, a traditional brick and mortar facility. Um, I also just wanted to highlight that the um, state opioid response program you heard from Missouri, um, this is a little bit of information from Kentucky. So Kentucky, as I mentioned, um, they have really established uh, emergency department rapid um, initiation of buprenorphine um, with 24 seven access to an evaluation by an addiction medicine specialist physician. Um, so again, another uh, kind of avenue um, through which to, uh, to be able to provide um, individuals with, uh, with um, this type of model. 
New Jersey is actually has um, instituted low threshold buprenorphine induction across its uh, seven harm reduction centers um, across the state. So really um, enabling individuals to um, not only uh, access other harm reduction um, services, including naloxone, fentanyl test strips, but, but uh, be providing them the option of um, being able to start buprenorphine um, uh, as a way of, um, of engaging individuals in care. Um, similarly, in New Mexico, the full spectrum people with opiate use disorder care model is another low barrier clinical approach, um, again, designed to really uh, address the morbidity and mortality that is associated with MIUD um, in a rural underserved um, county of uh, Rio um, Arriba. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, our, um, the PPW, so the pregnant and postpartum women um, grant program, this is uh, a particular grant program that also funds states. So the state of Connecticut, both at the Wheeler Clinic and intercommunity community um, sites, uh, are, have adopted um, a model called PROUD, which essentially utilizes a low threshold buprenorphine medication model of care, um, such that women who are coming into care um, are offered buprenorphine at the time of admission, um, and as another way of kind of um, enabling medication first. And um, this model really focuses heavily on extensive outreach in communities where opiate use is most prevalent, so that um, again, really making sure that there is no barrier um, to, uh, uh, to access, no barrier to, um, to services that are tailored to the needs of the individual and, and um, developed in conjunction with that individual. So I'm gonna stop there um, and uh, happy to take questions and also really looking forward to um, hearing from uh, my other panelists, colleagues. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Olson. Really great to see uh, the funding opportunities that are available and uh, the success stories, of course. Um, so I'm gonna now turn it over to Dr. Barbara Bazaron, the Director of the DC Behavioral Health, Department of Behavioral Health. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really delighted uh, to be here and to share some of the things that we are doing within the District of Columbia uh, to make access as easy as possible for individuals who have substance use disorders. I, I'd like to first start, next slide, by talking a little bit about the Department of Behavioral Health. Um, we are the single state agency for the District of Columbia for both substance abuse and uh, mental health services. And one of the things that I think is so fortunate uh, for us is that we're, we are a Medicaid expansion state which means that uh, our SUV services are under our 1115 waiver and uh, the remainder of services that are not Medicaid eligible are offered uh, through our local dollar allocation uh, from uh, which is a part of our local budget. Um, I'm also fortunate in that I have a mayor who's very supportive of behavioral health as well as a council that's very um, supportive of behavioral health. Uh, we do use and implement the recovery-oriented system of care model, which many of you know about, the Ross model, uh, which you, and is really designed to meet people where they are. And I've heard that a number of times uh, throughout the presentation today. Uh, we, are, uh, we certify the behavioral health provider network for the full range of, of services and support uh, within uh, the District of Columbia. The other thing I think that is unique about the District of Columbia is that we also offer um, some direct services. We offer a, uh, a number of safety net services uh, to support individuals uh, with behavioral health needs. This includes having an urgent care clinic, both for children, as well as youth, uh, where people can walk in and get uh, the services and supports they need. It also includes having a pharmacy um, on site where people can also get medication if they don't have uh, insurance. And by the way, within the district, about 98% of our population uh, is insured. Uh, we also offer a full range of crisis intervention uh, services as well as inpatient psychiatric care. 
Uh, here, we really embrace harm reduction and it is infused within all of the services and supports that we offer. And we have really spent over the past couple of years enhancing our harm reduction services. This includes uh, our syringe uh, services, our uh, increases in the distribution of naloxone, um, also uh, distributing fentanyl test strips and making uh, all of our services low barrier, and you'll hear a little bit about that uh, to access uh, care. Uh, next slide, please. One of the things that we uh, do uh, and did uh, was we changed our regulatory requirements so that rather than having one place in the district where people had to go in order to get an assessment and referral for substance use services. We made that a requirement for all of our providers. So uh, an individual can walk into any of our providers and they can get uh, uh, assessed and referred for treatment if they so choose to do so. Um, the other thing is that we found that we really had to spend some time kind of getting the, the word out about services. And through our SOAR grant, through our Live Long DC, State Opiate Response Program, we uh, have uh, now, uh, people can text 888-811 uh, uh, and they can get information around the location of treatment services if they're interested. They also can get information on how they can get naloxone uh, and fentanyl test strips and we will deliver it to their door if they want or they can go and pick it up at a, at a site. We're trying to make this as easy as possible because as someone said, we gotta really think about keeping people alive and listening to them in terms of when they're ready for care. I think uh, others have talked about the fact that uh, we do offer um, uh, expert at all of our acute care hospitals and we have a large core of peers. We do think that uh, people with lived experience must be throughout the system of care, and, and they really are very helpful in helping to engage individual in services. We also provide on-demand buprenorphine for insured and underinsured through our BUDAP program, and so uh, medication is widely available. Next, please. Um, within the district, the other thing here again, um, looking at how we make our services as low barrier as possible. As I said earlier, we have peers who work uh, throughout the community, in the community, uh, engaging and re-engaging individuals uh, who are interested in care. We have a mobile band that travels to all of the hotspots in the area. Uh, so uh, we're, we're bringing the service to people so they don't have to go anything, they can just step into the van or they can talk to someone literally in the street uh, if, uh, if they choose to do so. We also encourage every eligible practitioner to become buprenorphine wavered. As a matter of fact, when I uh, took over this area of responsibility, I required that all DBH uh, physicians assigned to our government operations be bup wavered as a requirement. Uh, we have also provided a lot of resources and support uh, both uh, human and financial to DC jail to increase uh, access to MUD and other tra treatment services. And, and that too is um, exciting. Got to get people where they are. Uh, next, please. Um, these are some things that we planned activities that we will be launching during this fiscal year, which has already begun. One is we are currently in the process of developing a 24 seven stabilization and sobering center that will provide immediate access to treatment and care coordination. And as, as uh, someone mentioned earlier, if somebody enters the, the uh, stabilization and sobering center, they will be able to get physical health care as well as uh, behavioral health care, and they will have a place uh, to stay for up to 24 hours, and they will be able to be connected to care uh, if they so desire. They can come back as often as they need. We understand that SUD uh, is a chronic relapsing disease, and uh, you know, have to be ready. 
Um, the other thing that we're doing is we will be supplying laptops and cell phones to uh, the most vulnerable residents within the District of Columbia. Somebody talked about telehealth. Um, telehealth is uh, important. It's an important tool in our toolkit. However, what we found uh, during COVID is that individuals with SUD had low utilization of telehealth. And some of the reasons was because they didn't have access to the equipment. And so uh, in addition to laptops and cell phones, we're also gonna place stations in the community uh, so that people with limited access uh, to these tools can walk in uh, to a community center and get access to telehealth if that's what they, the way they choose to uh, receive uh, services. Um, we are doing some exciting things within the District of Columbia. As I said, harm reduction really is something that is critically important to me. I think you have to meet people where they are and you have to uh, uh, let the person really drive the care as opposed to us uh, uh, doing it on their behalf. We have two examples within uh, our community of low threshold programs that increase access to care. The first uh, will be presented by Dr. Joseph Muller uh, from Unity, Unity Healthcare Walk-In Clinic. And the second will be presented by Angela Fullwood Wood, uh, who is an MSW at the Family and Medical Counseling Service. And so I'll now turn it over to Dr. Muller. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Dr. Mueller, and I'm the director of addiction medicine at Unity Healthcare. Um, and should I advance my own slides? I can either share these or I can uh, uh, give direction. Great, thank you. Um, so Unity Healthcare is a large federally qualified health center in DC. We have traditional community health center locations, as well as a handful of school-based health centers. We also were founded as a healthcare for the homeless organization, and we retain um, uh, clinic locations in a number of shelters, as well as running the local um, uh, uh, PEPV housing sites and respite centers, and also conducting street outreach. Um, and then we're also the contractor for the medical provide for medical care in the DC jail. So all in all, we serve roughly one in seven DC residents annually, uh, and that's the context for our um, buprenorphine treatment program. Uh, next slide, please. So our uh, goal was within a, a traditional. Uh, community health center setting to lower the um, barriers to accessing buprenorphine. And so we set up the walk-in clinic um, in one of our community health centers uh, in order to make it more convenient for people to access care quickly. Um, the, our East of the River location is located uh, on the ground floor of a building from a partnering organization that um, uh, focuses on um, people with history of substance use disorders and unstable housing, the So Others Might Eat organization, um, and is located conveniently to a number of bus lines and metro lines, and uh, is a large, busy um, clinic. We created in three half days a week, uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday in the afternoon, where if you show up by uh, 1 p.m., we guarantee that you'll be seen the same day. And luckily, our clinic um, has a number of integrated resources, including an on-site pharmacy, um, a case manager, and behavioral health clinician, so that we can often get people medication um, that same visit. The staffing for our clinic is just a medical provider who is has a regular um, suite of patient schedule, but has a couple of blocked slots for um, walk-in patients, um, and our peer recovery coach. We have a couple of slots blocked every session, um, but not all of those are filled. And if more people uh, arrive that day than are blocked, we make sure that they're seen. So typically we've had this we've had this program running for about a year now. We will see one to two patients actually show up um, for each session. And so that comes to about three to six in a usual week. 
We had initially envisioned this as a way to get people um, started in care who hadn't been seen before. We're actually finding, though, that two thirds of patients who come are um, patients who are being seen at one of our other locations or at the same location had missed appointments or had fallen out of care. Um, and this is another tool for um, retaining them in care in a more flexible model. Uh, next slide, please. Um, there's been uh, a few challenges that we encountered up front. Um, one is we have this walk-in service available specifically for medications for opioid use disorder, but we don't have it available for other patients. We have a, a same-day appointment model that works differently. And so we would have patients coming in trying to access care, but may not express it in a way that our front desk staff understood they were trying to come into this walk-in clinic. Um, and so there were some cycles of re-education of talking about the different terminology that people may use to say that I'm here to get um, treatment for opioid use disorder. And that's improved over time. But we did have some patients who said, oh, I, you know, I came yesterday and they said, sorry, they didn't have any appointments available um, because our front desk staff didn't um, uh, recognize what they were seeking treatment for. Uh, another challenge is that... Um, while we've been able to get people in and treated the same day, that has correlated then to sometimes unpredictable wait times. So a patient may show up at 11 in the morning, knowing that they have to be there by 3 p.m., but the break in the other patients already scheduled for that day might not happen until 2 p.m., and then you have a, a very frustrated person who may be reaching out for the first time and has been waiting for a long time, even before they see um, a mm -hmm. clinician or a peer recovery coach. Uh, so we've tried to adjust the timing of where those blocked slots are and um, have our peer recovery coach reach out to them if there is a delay in seeing the provider to um, get the process of assessment and engagement going early. Um, the other thing that we've noticed is that um, we have to address our insurance challenges right up front. Um, uh, Dr. Bazaran mentioned the wonderful program we have in DC that allows access to buprenorphine even for uninsured or underinsured patients, and I, I'm dreading here the uh, Medicare Advantage um, plans with uh, that are sometimes hard to figure out what they cover right, right up front. So if we might see someone at three o'clock and only finish their visit at four, and then we notice they have an insurance barrier, it might be a lot harder to get the medication that day. Whereas if the first thing that we do is confirm their insurance, um, we can get the ball rolling so that uh, things go more smoothly. Um, uh, that's all that I wanted to present. I did want to thank in particular um, uh, uh, SAMHSA and CSAT and uh, the Department of Behavioral Health in, here in DC that has supported our program, including this, um, this incremental step. Um, and I also wanted to uh, give a shout out to our peer recovery coach and our um, uh, the care coordinator who mans our hotline. At the same time as introducing the walk-in program, we created a hotline so that patients could reach out and not be put on hold um, to have uh, issues that come up addressed promptly. Um, and those two relationships, the peer and the uh, care coordinator specifically for our opioid recovery program um, have really been essential to its success. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll turn it over. Thank you, Dr. Mueller. We're now gonna hear from Ms. Wood. Good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be here. My name is Angela Wood, and I'm the COO at Family and Medical Counseling Service. And I'm going to, much of what I'm going to talk about has been covered. So I'm just kind of talk kind of about how we operationalize some of the concepts that we've heard throughout um, this afternoon's discussion. Uh, next slide. Family and Medical Counseling, we are a nonprofit FQHC. We're also located in the District of Columbia. We have an office in Southeast DC, and then we also have an office in Prince George's County, Maryland. We uh, were founded in 1976 as a, pri a private practice in social work or in behavioral health. And so for us, we, you know, it's natural for us to address substance use disorders and mental health disorders because that was really our foundation. And then we folded in the primary medical care services and much of our harm reduction program. Um, we expanded our services to include medical and other support services starting back in the mid 90s and have continued to expand our reach into the community. Next slide, please. So we see our program as a comprehensive harm reduction and treatment services program. 
And our program has what we see or what I grouped as three components, outreach services, and then linkage to other services in the community. So key to our mobile model, and this is, I'm talking, it's uh, our model is both mobile, a combination of mobile and in office, but focusing on our mobile model, um, really outreach has been the cornerstone for that. We use peers, individuals with lived experience and individuals who are trusted in the community. And that has been key, that going up to people who may be still actively using and engaging them in a dialogue or conversation for us has been most successful using people who reflect our community and using people who have lived a life and have some experience under their belt to be able to share with people and, and help to move them along a treatment continuum. And we do feel that that is up to the individual as to when they decide that they wanna stop using, we wanna be there for them, but we wanna help them to use safely if they're not at a place where they're ready for treatment. The only thing I would say about that model is that it does require training of the outreach team, many coming from the 12 step program, many coming from abstinence based models and helping them to buy into the harm reduction model really is a full stop moment um, for a full, you can keep it on this slide, a full stop moment for people. So we think the training of that outreach team has been really critical. And then training them on MOUD services and making sure that they're clear on what's going to happen with this patient when we engage them. On our mobile unit, we do a combination of things. So we do individual and community education. The education piece is huge, not just for our outreach workers, but for members of our community, for family members and others. And especially when we talk about the distribution of Narcan, when we talk about fentanyl test strips, that it's important for community members, family members and friends to understand what this means and why this is important that we have this in our community. That has been a huge piece for us. So we do a combination of individual sessions, but we also do community conversations with groups who have a vested interest in understanding the impact of substance use in their community. We do distribute naloxone or Narcan. We do distribute fentanyl test strips and safe injection equipment from that unit. But that is also done with a medical provider on board for a couple sessions a week. And she can enroll in a care coordinator. So that team goes out, they will do assessments. They will um, engage the person, do some physical assessment. Our provider does wound care basic primary care services on the unit, and then she can also prescribe electronically, and people can pick up their prescriptions from the local pharmacy that we collaborate with. We also couple that with HIV and Hep C testing, so that when you're at that unit, you can learn your HIV status, you can take a Hep C test, and we do incentivize them for that. Um, so that they can learn their status along with receiving their safe injection equipment, safer sex kits, and all of those materials. Um, the other piece that we're adding to that now that we expect to bring on board on uh, September and um, November of 2022 are harm reduction vending machines. The goal of our harm reduction vending machines are, is to give people access to Narcan and fentanyl test strips and other safe injection equipment with the exception of syringes 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we are working in partnership with our fire and EMS staff and our machines will be placed, the initial three machines will be placed at local firehouses and communities where they have seen <clears throat> significant overdoses. So we're working with them on that. <clears throat> we also link people to primary care. And this is an area that I've heard people on the call talk about that is a struggle, is getting you from that mobile unit into primary care. So we've been watching that process and how it impacts retention. And our goal is to switch out our unit to a full medical unit so that that person, if they choose, if they don't want to go into a traditional, our traditional site, that they will be able to get all of their primary care needs handled on our mobile unit by our nurse practitioner. <clears throat> We also link people to substance use disorder services, both inpatient and outpatient. We are an intake and assessment site, as Dr. Bazron said, that that expansion has been critical to getting people access. We also, though, incorporated helping the patients get a identification. Now, that's a minor thing, but it really turns into a major thing because 
if you encounter the police, if you have our card saying that you can have syringes, but if you don't have identification, that can just lead to a negative interaction with law enforcement. So we are helping our uh, recipients to get a government issued ID. And if they don't have, if they don't qualify for the free programs, we are able to pay for them to get a government issued ID from our local um, Department of Motor Vehicles. And we also refer them to care coordination services. Care coordination begins at the unit, but they can come into the office to receive care coordination. And if not, they can continually receive those services on our mobile unit to make sure that they're getting access to other support services that they might need, whether it's housing assistance, whether it is um, to some people who are ready to look for employment, whether it's treatment, but we can work with them on all of those things on the unit. Next slide. The program data right now, since January, we've enrolled about 150 people in our mobile program. Um, we get an average of six new clients enrolled each month, but retention is only about 30%. And we think some of that is that after three visits, we were having them come into our brick and mortar location. So going ahead, we're looking at trying to continually provide those services on the unit, because we know for those individuals who are actively using, they will return to the unit and they know where to find the unit. So we know that if we're there, we can catch and see them on that unit. So we're switching that out. Um, we usually distribute about 400 naloxone kits and uh, fentanyl test strips each month, and that each annually we distribute upwards of 200,000 syringes to individuals who are still using in the community. Next slide. The lessons learned. So for us, our team works best with the peer at the core. Um, along with licensed medical providers, which we use a nurse practitioner and care coordinators who are generally bachelor's level trained um, and also have lived experience in the community. So that core team is who is at our vehicle. But peers, usually when the vehicle is out, there are about six peers that are with that vehicle at all times. And they're engaging the individuals in the community, but they're also looking out for the safety and well being of the staff who are on the unit providing services. Our vehicle is equipped to provide medical care. And we think that that works best for um, linkage and retention, as I just mentioned. Um, also, education and harm reduction, educational harm reduction versus an abstinence model for all staff is critical because I think we all have to understand kind of what our goal is in this comprehensive harm reduction model. Um, the other lesson we learned that peer outreach and navigator pay must be competitive. This is, um, you know, we live in a city where there's a lot going on where they're in areas where crime and violence occurs. And we've really had to take a step back and look at the salary that we're paying people when they're out in the community, really putting themselves at risk to make sure that we get individuals into care, whether it's primary care or substance use disorder treatment. Um, the education com component is critical. The, um, our community education focuses on understanding naloxone and on fentanyl test strips. However, we try to normalize this, that when people think about our Narcan distribution, they most often think about it as the injector who's on the corner who, you know, you don't necessarily want to see in your neighborhood. But if you're taking any kind of opioid on a regular basis, you too could have an overdose and or if you have a child who is using with fentanyl so prevalent in the drug supply in the district, if they're smoking marijuana, it could be laced with fentanyl. We don't know that. So we're really trying to give people the bigger picture of substance use in our community. Um, retention is of course a major concern and we think it requires close attention, close and regular attention to retention of the patient. So our peers do both. They do enrollment and they do retention to try to re-engage individuals who may have dropped out of care. Um, more recently, we've expanded our hours of operations to include evenings and weekends, which are necessary to reach the community. So now we're out in the community every evening up until about 8.30 and on Saturdays as well on a rotating schedule. But our plan is to expand our evening and weekends, realizing that people are in the community and that our work doesn't stop at the end of the business day. Okay. I think that's my final slide. Okay, and thank you very much, Ms. Wood. <laughs> I appreciate you in the community. And so I'm now going to turn it back uh, to our master of ceremony. 
<laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, really amazing work that's being, being done in DC and really appreciate the overview. Um, so I'm going to now open up. Um, I see a couple of hands up. So I will uh, start with um, Christopher. Yes, thank you all so much for this amazing work. And I have uh, two questions. Um, one question for Angela Wood. Um, what is the number that you pay your peer outreach and navigator people? Just give us an idea. Second question. Uh, well, let me take that question and, uh, and then I'll ask a follow-up if I have time. So right now we're anywhere from 20 to $22 an hour. Thank you. And one follow-up question for Barbara Bazron. How do you, you mention that you give, you're providing some resources to the DC jails to enable this program. What resources are you providing, please? Uh, we actually are providing um, funds through our SOAR grant. And the funds are to do everything from ensuring that SBIRT is available to actually developing some specialized units within the jail and making sure that when someone steps down and is a returning citizen, uh, they are then connected uh, to care. And so there are a whole variety of resources that we're providing on an ongoing basis there. Thank you very much. And uh, since uh, Unity is the, the medical provider in the jail, um, I can just expand a little bit. At the DC jail, um, all three uh, approved medications for opioid use disorder are, are started. Right. Um, and then there's a team of addiction counselors and peer recovery coaches to help connect patients to ongoing treatment when they're released, um, in addition to uh, some new residential treatment programs that have opened up within the jail. Right, and I think um, uh, Dr. Mueller, you may talk uh, might talk a minute about we do have now a specialized unit for women um, who have a substance use uh, uh, disorder in the jail, and uh, a male unit is uh, uh, about to be launched. And we think that it's really important to provide the treatment they need, regardless of where they happen to be. Thank you. Uh, Abby, please unmute. Hi, yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I had a question um, for the two, the first presenters um, regarding the low induction. Um, and I was wondering about like what their prescribing looked like. Um, I know many providers in our area, um, you know, that can range from folks having to come in daily for, you know, buprenorphine and methadone. Um, to uh, some take home, um, especially more common with buprenorphine than methadone. So I was wondering what their prescribing looked like for individuals as they were coming in um, and how folks were required to like receive their doses. Uh, so I, I can speak to that for our practice. So uh, we are not an opioid treatment program um, in the community, so we don't do methadone in the community. Um, but uh, buprenorphine, a typical um, uh, start will be weekly visits while a patient is um, first um, getting on a stable dose. Um, there might be um, uh, telemedicine for some uh, of those visits um, or like a brief follow-up visit to monitor um, after the uh, medication is started. Um, and then depending on how stable patients are in terms of achieving their goals on the medication, um, we might do biweekly or monthly visits. Um, uh, and then for patients who have been really stable for some time, we might have even less frequent visits than that. And then they pick up their medication from the pharmacy as they would their, uh, their other mm -hmm. routine medications. Maybe just to add a piece from, um, from SAMHSA, you know, during the, um, the COVID pandemic, there was a flexibility um, that was provided from SAMHSA, particularly for methadone take-home um, doses. Right. It, um, that, uh, you know, 42 states and the District of Columbia um, uh, took advantage of those flexibilities. So that, those flexibilities include that for kind of more unstable patients, they were eligible for up to 14 days of methadone take-homes, for stable patients, up to 28 days. 
without kind of requiring the same time and treatment um, uh, regulatory um, uh, kind of component um, that had been in place prior to, uh, to the COVID pandemic. Um, so that meant that essentially, you know, individuals could actually now take home medication. Um, and during COVID, you can understand that really the, the goal was to make sure that, um, that we could continue and that in, uh, the providers could continue medication access um, and minimize the risk of transmission of COVID. That flexibility has been um, extended through guidance that, um, and it will continue because it was tied, since it was tied to the COVID um, public health emergency declaration, it will now continue one year uh, past the end of that declaration, whenever that might be. Um, and, you know, SAMHSA has heard from and learned a tremendous amount. And there's been research also um, that has come out during the, the past two years that that has been a safe and effective way of um, really being able to provide medication for individuals. Um, uh, and so that is something that, um, that is currently then under, um, SAMHSA is really reviewing with other partners to, um, uh, to, uh, to assess kind of, you know, what, um, what we can actually kind of move forward more permanently. Thank you. Um, Leslie's back. <laughs> Can you unmute, please? I think I had called on you earlier. Leslie, did you have your hand up? I apologize. Somehow I keep getting hands. <laughs> we can hear you now. Yeah. Oh. No she's... question for me. Oh, no Somehow question. Sorry. Okay. My hand keeps going up. Okay, no worries. <laughs> uh, Luke. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. I want to say that uh, this this panel is uh, ju just the best in the country, and and uh, my uh, my congratulations on assembling the panel. Now, I, I want to say some things that uh, I want to make some comments. I'm not asking really asking questions. Uh, quick background is uh, I've been the CEO of. Uh, uh, a New York City program, residential treatment program called Camelot for 46 years. Okay, so uh, the, the, um, I think um, it would be beneficial to include in the future um, some professional from the, the treatment communities that, you know, that's the treatment communities of America that were formerly known as therapeutic uh, communities, oh, there's okay. all kinds of criticism about them and their approaches, and 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 uh, being uh, being abstinence driven and intolerant. And I, I mean, I really think that that that's a a thing of the past. I mean, our my our own program, which is about 75 beds and two facilities, and in the process of building another uh, 100 beds that will include women and women and children. Um, we have people who are on uh, buprenorphine uh, as a as a detox, buprenorphine as a, me uh, a maintenance, and methadone. Even though we don't distribute methadone, we we get the methadone from the from the clinic for for the patient. Um, so it is, and and as well as uh, uh, psychotropic medications. So. The, the you know the strong emphasis on you know abstinence is, is sort of like a bad thing it's not a bad thing it's not a bad it's not a bad word i don't know how it became a bad word uh, well maybe i do know how it became a bad word but what we do right we use best practices which you know i mean i have a little problem with best practices also because you know they come from on high and what we'll do is, is we listen to the clients. We listen to the patients. What do you want? What's your end goal? What's realistic? I mean, to a person, they, they say, I don't want to be on medication. I don't want to be dependent upon medication. Okay, but that's, that's good. That's an end goal. That's nothing that we impose. That's what we hear from the patients. And if I would, what I'm suggesting to this group and into the future is to include, uh, include 
representatives from the treatment communities of America, because there's valuable information to be gained from them. Uh, they, they, you, you know, they're, uh, they're working with the people on the ground. They're working not only in the poor communities, they're working in the white middle-class communities. They're working with their families. And there's an awful lot to be learned in combination with everything that was stated today. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Luke, for, for sharing that. Uh, Dr. Olson, would you wanna? Yeah, no, if I could just, and thank you, um, Luke, uh, for sharing that. I, I think um, I think that the um, you're absolutely right in that, that there are multiple um, voices that uh, you know are um, uh, that need to be around the table because I think ultimately um, you know the goal of really helping to save lives and um, and improve people's help to you know have individuals kind of improve their health. Um, however, they also kind of see that um, and what might work the best. Um, for them, I think is incredibly important and really centering the voices of, you know, kind of the people who are also being served. And, um, and, uh, and I, so I think that, you know, part of um, the history of kind of, uh, whether it's addiction treatment, you know, the spectrum of harm <coughs> reduction treatment recovery uh, communities, um, that, you know, there is a lot of common ground there. And, um, and I think having those conversations and being able to engage in those conversations um, is really the way that we're all going to collectively kind of get to, um, to where we all wanna be um, and where we want um, and we, where we are, uh, who we are kind of serving. When we have that as the, um, as the forefront, um, I think uh, that your point is really well taken that we need to be, um, you know, have other, other voices and learn, learn from each other. Thank you. Um, if I might, Javier, um, thank you for your, your comment. And I think earlier when we were uh, talking, um, uh, I hope it made it clear that we start with the patient and with the person, with the individual who is in need of the services and support so that they can drive uh, what happens. And if that person's goal is abstinence only, then you chart a course to do that. So I think that having a harm reduction focus does not obviate the fact that people, some people may want something different. And right. so I agree, all voices need to be at the table and we need to have kind of a, a continuum and sort of the <clears throat> of services available to individuals as opposed to simply, um, you know, this or that. So, and I would say for me, um, just adding to that, that I don't, I don't feel like abstinence is a bad word. And, and especially here in the district, yeah. I haven't experienced that. But what I have experienced is outreach workers who are coming to the table to do this work, who are grounded in the recovery model. And then it's a shocker when, you know, they have to learn that, okay, they get to choose if they want to stop and that the conversation starts with where they are. So I was putting that out more as a lesson learned for when hiring staff, because we've had some staff really struggle with the fact that it was a harm reduction model, which allowed that person mm -hmm. to make some personal choices about how they were going to move along the treatment continuum. And that one of those choices is that they may still want to use and that we're going to support them in that and make sure we keep them safe. So I was talking about it more from a hiring standpoint when we hire the outreach workers, many of whom come from the 12-step program, really focus on abstinence. So it's to me, it appears that in times it created an internal conflict for the employee, not necessarily for the treatment system in the city. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Levi. Hi, sorry. Um, just a real quick question. I'm sorry that we've got names already, but we were a little bit ago, we were talking about starting um, the treatment in the jail setting. I just had a quick, more of a process question is how soon is that MAT started in the jail versus and or how soon is it given before their release? Mm -hmm. Dr. Mueller, do you want to 
field that question. Yeah, and uh, we could certainly have another um, webinar on uh, Medicaid. Yes, services absolutely. Right, right, right. <laughs> uh, but at the DC jail, uh, it begins at intake. Um, it uh, people can get started on buprenorphine um, the minute they see a doctor, which is within a few hours of them coming to the jail, um, and continues as long as they remain here. Some people, unfortunately, are here for years, um, or, or they may transfer to other facilities. Thank you. And Karen? Uh, this will be our last question, but Karen, feel free to unmute yourself. Or maybe that's it. Uh, Karen, I think you're, yes. feel free to speak, yes. I just wanted to thank you all for allowing me to participate by listening. I think we learned quite a bit just by listening and developing the understanding of what is actually going on. I am a fiscal monitor for the Office of Behavior Health in Louisiana, and uh, we work on the LASOR uh, grant. And it, this was, has been very educational. A lot of it to intake for a person who's not on the actual behavior health side. I'm just a bean counter, but I appreciate being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I think that's a good note. Um, I just want to thank all the panelists for the really excellent presentations and, and of course, uh, our participants and everyone who attended for, for being part of this really important discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Uh,